and we came up with uh, some ratings which clearly demonstrated that the assumptions that underlay their decision to go ahead were deeply flawed. Welcome to the Rain Insights Podcast. I'm Emily Donahue. Perhaps your organization has a high tolerance for risk, or maybe it's risk averse. Regardless of how you approach risk, making a high stakes decision such as an acquisition, investment, or even a major hire will probably require input from teams across the business. But have you as a leader ever really examined the processes your teams use to come to a decision? In today's podcast, Rain's Chief Marketing Officer, Greg Radner, speaks to Jay Grusin and Steve Lindo. Their new book, Intelligent Analysis, How to Defeat Uncertainty in High Stakes Decisions, offers a new way of tackling the process that could bring better results. Let's listen. Well, welcome, Jay and Steve, to today's podcast. Uh, I'm really excited to talk to you uh, about decision making today. Uh, as you may know, Rain is is all about arming our members uh, with intelligence to help them make better decisions uh, and hopefully power better risk management outcomes. So I'm really interested to hear your perspectives on how to make better decisions. But before we get into that. Um, it's sort of an unusual collaboration with you two. I mean, you've got one person here, of 40 years as a senior U.S. intelligence officer, a trainer of other intelligence analysts, and then Steve, you got 40 years in financial services, risk management. So it's a little bit of unusual co collaboration. And how did you guys come about together? Well, thank you, Greg. Actually, it was not something that Jay and I planned at all. A chance introduction from uh, a mutual colleague, actually a, a, a very senior professor from University of Michigan, brought Jay and me together. And when we sat down and we were just doing, as, as, as people do, just kind of giving a little bit of an explanation of their background, um, after an initial conversation, what we realized is that we had unexpectedly um, had quite a similar situation or a similar experience over our, our years in the business of uh, encountering situations where decisions that were being made, especially high stakes decisions with long tailed consequences, um, they always seem prone to basically the same weakness. And the weakness wasn't inherently the, the data that was available to support the decision. It wasn't necessarily um, the analytics and the, the style of the company. What it really came down to was that in those situations, the individuals in the room, typically, they displayed the kind of um, characteristics that we all do uh, under pressure. Um, there were biases that entered into the discussion. There were blind spots. There were organizational influences. And that these characteristics were not isolated to the government world, which was Jay's history and experience, or to the business world that was mine. So in other words, what we realized is we actually had something like... Um, a similar background and experience, but uh, in totally different uh, arenas. And then lastly, one of the things that, that impressed us both in that first encounter was that, the, that that revelation that we had, that this was an important, perhaps a critical factor in decisions, was almost universally discounted by the participants in these decisions, who typically believed that over the years, their companies or their agencies had developed this kind of watertight decision-making process that was immune from the kinds of uh, biases and, and blind spots that I'm talking about. So that, inherently, that's the biggest blind spot of all, is that the process is immune uh, and that these distractions don't, uh, don't enter into the final decision. I'm really curious about the, the U.S. intelligence techniques that you've now adapted to the business world. So if you can tell me a little bit about that and how you went about doing that, too. Okay, first of all, again, thank you for having us on the show. At the end of the day, this book and in, in the intelligence techniques are really about managing your brain. What do I mean by that? Structured analytic techniques are at the heart of our book. They're about countering what goes on in our brains every day when we're assessing information. The emotions and biases that Steve mentioned are what make us human. But they also, our brains are also hardwired with them, and we see the world through these filters. It's impossible to set them aside, and they get in the way of consistently making objective, evidence-based decisions. We see these biases at work in every meeting. Just think about the last meeting you're in. The emotions and biases that filter through the discussions are evident, and they're oftentimes not manageable. Intelligence analysts are, are, not immune to are not immune to these, and the structured analytic techniques are just that. 
They structure analytic discussions to blunt the impact of emotions and biases and shift the focus of the discussion from personalities to data. This is not easy in my environment. They're not a silver bullet, but I have seen them play critical roles in sorting through some of the toughest problems when they're multiple stakeholders with strongly held views and time was shortest and stakes were highest. We just didn't have the luxury of meeting again next week when we had to write something overnight. Steve and I have chosen two that we think are most important for the commercial world to emphasize here and that we emphasize in the book. The first is how to shape the key intelligence question, defining the problem. And the second, which is really critical, is the key assumptions check, which stress tests the assumptions that underpin the decision after it's made. How about giving our listeners an example, you know, kind of the high stakes situation where the techniques that you outline really make a difference? Sure. I'd like be glad to do that, Greg. So we, we actually created an example right there in our book. We took a situation which we felt was relatively familiar to many of the readers of the book. So we thought about uh, a commercial real estate company making a very large property acquisition in a brand new market. And so as we envisaged it, the sales team had done all their research, they'd presented a very, very coherent, well thought out proposal. And the conclusion of the proposal is that the acquisition of the building would in fact be uh, a very significant success, would contribute to the bottom line, open up uh, their business in a brand new geography. So in our example, the company's chief risk officer looks at the substance of this well-researched proposal and says that because of the, the magnitude of the decision and its implications, that he would like to have that the arguments basically um, reviewed using uh, the same methodology that uh, we talk about uh, in our book and the one that Jay will be explaining in greater details. So the, the team gets together and what they do is they analyze um, all of the elements of the proposal in order to be able to determine if in fact uh, the proposal is, the, the recommendation is justified or not. So from a process standpoint, what we're really doing here, the best analogy that I have for this, is, uh, is like a speed bump. So you're driving in your car, you're going through some kind of neighborhood, it doesn't matter where your destination is, what kind of car you're driving, who you are. What happens when you come across a speed bump is that that's a signal that you're in an area where for one reason or another, uh, danger is lurking. And so the speed bump doesn't actually change your journey, doesn't really interfere with anything about your trip except just for a certain space of time, it slows you down and makes sure that you act in, with greater caution in a, in a particular area. And so that's, that's why the analogy of the speed bump is good because um, the, the type of test that uh, we describe in our book doesn't interfere with the, ultimately with the decision or how it's prepared or executed. Just make sure that that decision uh, is more carefully verified before the, the CEO um, basically inks the paper and the decision is finally made. I think that's a great point about the speed bump because being in the business world, these things happen really quickly and tend to, usually for these high stakes decisions, there's a time component to it. To it. But maybe you can describe um, your methods, sort of most important steps in meeting these challenges of making quick, uh, sound business decisions. The other thing that happens in, in your world, Greg, before I, I, I dive into the key intelligence question, is that oftentimes you're in a meeting and the group doesn't really understand or can agree upon what actually what problem you're actually trying to fix. And the key and, and developing the key intelligence question is really the start of everything, because everything after that, everything after that will will flow from the question, how you answer the question. Einstein, I'll use a quote from him. He said that if I had an hour to save the world, I'd use the first 55 minutes to define the question and then I could answer it in five minutes because the question is everything, and it really is. Let me give you an example, Greg. I'm going to use your name in vain here, okay? The wrong question leads to the wrong assessment. So, Greg, if I ask you this question, Greg, how much money did you launder last week? Hmm, okay. As opposed to what extent was Greg involved in money laundering? You see the difference? The first question, how much money did Greg launder last week, assumes he's guilty and only narrowly focuses on one thing, finding out, uh, proving his guilt. The other question is much more open and allows for a much different outcome. It could be, Steve could be, uh, Greg could be uh, involved a lot or not at all. And, and this is really what's important is to keep that question open and avoid jumping to conclusions in the question. 
And that's really hard to do. If you think about a spectrum moving from left to right, where on, on the left is absolute certainty and on the hard right is absolute uncertainty. If you, a, if you answer, ask a narrow question, you get a narrow answer. And you stay on the area that you're most comfortable in. You really don't go beyond that and look at the uncertainties. Listen to the two questions that we posed here for the real estate acquisition. Listen to the first one. To what extent will the acquisition support the company's five-year growth strategy? If you look at that question, it's very open, and it allows the analyst to explore both the risks and the opportunities posed by the investment. The marketing team, the selfish marketing team, focuses on how, how will the building compete with others in the area. And it automatically forecloses that broader assessment of the investment and really takes a look at just that one narrow piece of it. So something I'd like to add to uh, what Jay just said is that right now, um, pretty much everybody, including uh, those of your listeners, are actually in the middle of a situation where this the key intelligence question is relevant, and that is deciding um, when and on what terms they and their, their organization are going back to the workplace. So for example, if the question about whether or not it's time is focused very narrowly on whether the cost will be um, beneficial to the company or whether it's focused just on customer service or whether it's focused on um, employee safety, any one of those three um, focuses would be inherently would be too narrow. In other words, the question as to whether or not it's time to go back to the workplace would be framed too narrowly and the answer might ultimately be taken and a decision made, which could then later on have repercussions which would show it to have been uh, potentially a flawed decision. So we're really in the middle of situations um, where the question, the actual question, what is it that we have to decide, is really the first and critical step and, and it's going on all around us. I'll, I'll add one more point to that if I can. I, I, trained an, I train analysts a lot and getting the question right is some of the, one of the hardest things they have to do because they have to break an old habit, which is jumping to conclusions because they already know what the answer is and they already believe they know what the audience needs. And they have to break the habit of jumping to conclusions in the question. So when I said, how much money did he move last month? I immediately, I'm assuming, we're assuming Greg's guilt. And, and that, of course, is a really hard thing to get over because of the information they already have at hand. I did notice that you know the second of the two techniques that you mentioned, the key assumptions check, is a technique that you guys would employ to counter a lack of, I guess, objectivity in decision making. Can you explain a little bit more how that does, how that works? The key assumptions check is, is by far the most important tool that Steve and I introduce in the book. It's, it's a way of testing the assumptions that underpin the decision, in this case about the investment, after the decision is made. We don't, we, don't, uh, we don't poke around in how they make the decision, we only care about testing it after it's done and before it's implemented. The key assumption check tests the assumptions that underpin the likelihood of desired outcome, which is framed by the intelligence question. The process addresses multiple stakeholders' interests and the risks posed by thin or uncertain data. It reveals whether an assessment is on strong footing or not. It has three stages. One is to identify the key assumptions that underpin the, the assessment. Two, you rate the assumptions and then you communicate the findings. Let me explain how it looks. Imagine a matrix, and down the left-hand column are the assumptions that the group decides are the most important to supporting the decision to make the investment. Across the top are four different criteria that are rated. The first is the, the certainty of the data. Number two is the quality of the data. The third column, and this is interesting, engages the complexity of the problem by determining whether the failure of one assumption will spill over into, into impacting other assumptions. And the last one is an overall judgment about the impact of that assumption on the judgment. If it fails, what's the impact? The scale is rated on 9 to 10. And it's these discussions about selecting the, and selecting the assumptions, and it's the discussions about setting the ratings and determining what the, what the ratings mean when they're done, that's the heart of the matter, and that's what makes this tool so powerful. Because from the results of the key assumptions check come multiple aspects of the problem. First of all, we find out where the investment might be, it might be on strongest footing, where the investment might be vulnerable, and more important, we're looking for what we call linchpin assumptions. These are the two, one or two assumptions that really matter, the failure of which will, dis will undermine the investment and raise really important risks about it. In the commercial real estate example, the key assessment check assesses the validity of the proposal's assumptions about property condition, 
regional economy, and the talent pool. It determines which assumptions are the linchpin in the investment's probability of success. To be really clear about it, the key assumptions check is the only way we can really look ahead because we spotted the vulnerabilities and the strengths of the investment decision and we're able from that to, to develop the most likely outcome. And also mitigation strategies. Once we pick out the linchpin assumptions, if in fact they are vulnerabilities, then we can develop mitigations, mitigation strategies to blunt their impact. The last step in, in the key assumptions check is once you've gathered up all the data and you've made your judgments, you're able to communicate to the senior audience your best assessment of the likelihood of success of the investment strategy. It's put forward in what we call a bottom line up front. This is a first par the first lead paragraph that in one seven sentence paragraph provides the clear message to the audience about, about the answers to the intelligence question. It may seem like a laborious process and it can go on for a while, but the time and effort invested pale in comparison to the cost and consequences of failure. What uh, strikes me as being the most important takeaway from the, the technique that Jay was just describing is that through this method, um, the, the focus of the discussion changes from the personalities, right, those individuals that are involved in the decision, it takes you just always circles back onto the data, um, what it is, what its quality is. And that really is the, kind of the key influence that protects the objectivity that we were talking about earlier. I'd like to add just one more point, if I can, to Steve's. I've seen these, I've seen the key assumptions check work. I've seen it work when a group is really bogged down, when they can't get to the answer, when they're arguing over data. Intelligence analysts, for us, it's, it's, it's almost a sport. Uh, and, and the differences among analysts can be really strong and deeply held. And the key assumption check forces, forces people to focus on the data and not on personalities. And I've seen it really effectively break log jams and move people toward a decision. Maybe you can give our audience an example of, of how, how using a, uh, a key assumptions check can counteract some of the flaws in a company's um, decision-making process. Yeah, again, uh, the best example that we can give that really I think will resonate with um, your listeners is the article that we wrote, Jay and I wrote this article together in 2018, in which we dissected the um, expansion of the target corporation into the retail business in Canada. So that obviously we picked a situation which, which went south. There was a very uh, disastrous situation for a number of reasons as it fits the description that we gave earlier about it being complex and, and having multiple stakeholders involved. What we did was uh, we used the key assumptions check to reconstitute what were the founding assumptions of the team that decided that the, the target expansion into Canada was a go. And what we did is using then the, the, the rating method, we examined the, the amount of data and the source of it, and we came up with uh, some ratings which clearly demonstrated that the assumptions that underlay their decision to go ahead were deeply flawed. And most importantly, of all of those assumptions, perhaps the one which was least um, uppermost in their minds was all of the data systems to support their um, expansionary business in Canada. Those systems, they made the assumption that those systems would work as flawlessly as the native target systems worked uh, in the USA. Whereas in fact, in the, in the story, um, there were a lot of um, conditionality to those systems which ultimately uh, determined that the, their, their expansion turned into a disaster. So, um, you know, one of the takeaways from that story is that for a, a, an audience that's, um, you know, e examining our method, they might say that it's, it's easy in hindsight to pick apart a company's strategy. Um, you can always be super smart on a Monday morning uh, after uh, the, the football games over the weekend. But when you actually get into the detail of their decisions and the narrative, um, really, what the key assumptions check would have done if they had known about and had employed this, this technique is it would have saved them from themselves, that they were the ones that ultimately were the cause uh, of this disastrous decision. So in order for, you know, for this example to be readily available, we've included it um, as, um, in, in its entirety in the appendix of the book. So, of course, it's also available for, for those that choose to read it.
Well, thanks, Steve. I never feel uh, very smart on a Monday morning, but that was good information. I appreciate it. So this is a question for both you guys. How do you envision organizations using the method that you describe in the book? So we thought very carefully about um, the audience for the book, and we realized that, in fact, it wasn't just one audience, really. It was two parallel audiences. Um, one of them is the executives themselves, right? The decision makers across whatever industry organization um, is in question. And the other is the team of analysts that actually pour through all of the data, attempt to reconcile all of the expert opinions and, and do the forecasting analytics and so on. So what we did is we created kind of a parallel track in the book. So at one level, the executives can read the appraisal of each of the chapters describing the stages in the technique. And so they can get an understanding as to how the technique works and uh, or the method works and what is its purpose and how it can be, it, it can be applied to their business. At the second level, um, in each of the chapters, we have all of the detailed mechanics, how to utilize uh, the various stages of the method, um, examples, exercises, really, what we're saying is um, this is the, um, the end product of uh, you know, Jay's years of experience um, teaching these methods to the audience um, in the government world. That said, um, what we also recognize is uh, you know, any, any book that, that proclaims and explains a method like ours is really like a roadmap which is, of course, as great as it tells you where you are and, and how to get to the destination, but the actual use of the technique um, really needs to have um, you know, a much more physical presence within the company. And the first order of that implementation, the company has to be buy-in from the senior executives. If they understand and recognize the value, um, not only in the method, but in the consequences of not using the method, then they can um, create the situation where the, their teams of analysts can then use the method, they can learn, we can help them with training, and we can also, in certain situations where the issues are particularly contentious, where there's a lot of uncertainty to reconcile, we can also act as facilitators. In other words, we are completely neutral to the outcome. We just make sure that the method is adhered to um, in a very rigorous manner to make sure that the, the, the louder voices, so to speak, get appropriately contained and the very quiet voices that maybe have that magic information that will change the decision don't get um, drowned out. So what's next for you guys? Now that your book has been published, what's next? So where we go from here is that with, uh, hopefully with the, um, the level of awareness that's been created as a result of our book and as a result of um, being able to communicate with uh, expert networks like yourselves, um, is that we'll continue um, performing, conducting the kinds of workshops that we've already conducted, where we take a smart uh, team of, of expert analysts and we give them uh, a complete workout through the method, then they get to practice in a simulation and so on. And as, as a corollary to that, so that uh, our method isn't sort of completely stuck in, in theoretical terms, we also have on our website, we have a blog, and what we do is we're applying our method in the sound bites to current situations. So they could be social, they could be economic, could be to do with companies, could be to do with um, major um, situations like the pandemic. That's our way of staying current with what's going on in the world and showing that our method can be applied um, in, in, almost universally where the, high stake, where the stakes are high and the level of uncertainty is correspondingly high too. I'd like to add just three quick points uh, to reinforce three quick points that surfaced during the, during the talk. First of all, Steve and I are agnostic about how you get to the decision. Our process works across business areas and across data sets. It doesn't matter what you're doing or what you're doing. The, the approach works. Second, um, we really don't want to second guess the, uh, the risk tolerance of organizations. We're about focusing on the decision and helping them develop mitigation strategies, not about telling them how much risk they can tolerate. So, Greg, just one last thing I'd like to say, and that is that um, dur during our preparation for the book and our, our discourse with uh, various different organizations um, in the last couple of years, we recognize that it's a challenge
to overcome that blind spot that I mentioned right at the beginning of our conversation, which is that most organizations with a long and a successful track record of making decisions don't believe that there's a need to have the kind of structured analysis that our method provides. So how we intend to tackle that basically is, you know, we have four parts to our strategy. The first is to introduce and hopefully to be convincing to audiences that are as expert and well-connected as, uh, as yours in, in today's podcast. And then with those where the, the executives feel that there's a potential uh, to materially improve their decision-making in these uh, difficult circumstances, we can conduct a trial or a pilot would be either with an active or potentially, a, let's say, a past decision. Show in the real world for each company where we're welcome that these methods really can make a difference. And then with those two stages complete, then we can move into the stage where we can conduct workshops, we can basically help their experts train in these methods. And once they're self-sufficient, um, just be on call in case every now and again, uh, there's a need for us to provide either counseling on the method or potentially to act, as I mentioned before, in that facilitation role. The book is Intelligent Analysis, How to Defeat Uncertainty in High Stakes Decisions. I want to thank you, uh, Jay and Steve, for joining our podcast today. If our listeners are interested in following up with you directly, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? I think the best way is definitely for them just to either Google the book itself on Amazon, or alternatively, uh, they can track us down on our website, um, Intelligent Analysis. Um, just Google it, and then they'll find our contact information. And we'd be delighted to hear from them, answer questions, um, possibly um, even help them understand the methods. That would be our pleasure. Jay Grusin and Steve Lindo are authors of the new book, Intelligent Analysis, How to Defeat Uncertainty in High Stakes Decisions. RAIN is a risk intelligence company that provides access to critical insights, analysis, and support to ensure business continuity and resilience for our members. You can find out more about us at RAINNetwork.com. That's R-A-N-E-Network.com. I'm Emily Donahue. Thanks for listening.